Back in 2019, when Andrew and I first began to think and pray about the sermons that we would preach in 2020, today's sermon was set for a summer Sunday. And in January, when we shuffled the sermon schedule to accommodate my just announced June departure, today's sermon was rescheduled for the end of May. And today, uh, as we're approaching the end of May, as we languish and strain under the weight of waiting during a virus-induced worldwide pandemic, today's sermon set months and months ago seems a perfect fit. Now there are some beautiful scriptures that are invitations from God to draw closer and to realize something better, something better out of life. Words like abide and restore, dwell and rest. These words appeal to our heavy hearts, but too often fail to translate into actual actions that some of us can make sense of. We ask things like, how does one do that? Really, how does one actually enjoy that something other? Well, abide and dwell. They're words that Jesus used. He used them as he offered this something other, other than. Other than the weight of hard times that squash the human soul. Other than the pain of hard circumstances that test one's endurance. Other than the angst and fear and anxiety that seem to suck the joy out of life. Jesus once offered, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus still offers a better way to approach whatever it is that weighs us down. Before he ascended, Jesus entertained his disciples. In John 21, we read about a scene after a fruitless night of fishing. And Jesus visited with them and he invited them, come and have breakfast. And Jesus fed them. He fed them bread and grilled fish right there at the shore. It was a respite from their labors. And sometimes for us, the most obvious, simple things are what's best in the moments of our weariness. And then there are Jesus' most famous, most familiar, perhaps, abide in me words. I am the true vine, John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself but must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now honestly, for most of us here this morning, we know that our ability to do life comes directly from Jesus. And these are amazing words, all of these invitations. They're literally choice offerings of our shepherd's wisdom for how sheep, how you and I should be doing daily life. And most of us know what these passages say. And most of us like what Jesus offered and what he continues to offer. And we want these things. We want them in our daily lives because life can be heavy and it can be hard and it can be complicated. Now this morning, for just a few moments, I'd like to slip back in time. I'd look, open up and hang out in an ancient diary and consider a psalmist's take on abiding in God. As much as most of us, more often we prefer, find daily life to be heavy and hard and complicated, our more recent days have been, shall we say, more so than most days. And as we start this morning, I'm going to invite you to do yourself a small favor. I'd like you to settle down in your chair, kind of wiggle around a little, get, get all comfy. And I'd like you to take a couple of deep breaths, in and out, in and out. Don't try to take notes. Don't try to think about remembering. Just soak in the psalmist words, words of abiding, of dwelling in God, allowing him to begin to calm our racing hearts. Listen as I read Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High 
will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The psalmist, the psalmist was a poet and artist with words who painted colorful images of life under God's care. Life lifted above the dailiness because we abide in God. We abide in Jesus. Now I acknowledge at this point in my sermon that some preachers will think I have failed by not turning uh, these poetic words into promises that would give us license to be reckless today. That I have not seen promises but only poetic word pictures chafes against the desire to hear, it's okay, you won't get sick. I would think, however, that I had failed if I set you forth with empty promises, treating the psalm as a magic amulet based on reckless misuse of poetic images. The psalmist helps us see our invisible God through these colorful physical descriptions. And the psalmist, the psalm that he wrote, though they may report history, even reflect principles that today we might call silence, they're neither, neither history nor silence science. The Psalms are poetry and prose. They're word art, allowing us to capture in our hearts what our minds might miss. And we do well to read the Psalms with our hearts, for they were written from the psalmist's art. They are essentially pages from a diary, a record of life's experiences. The psalmist encountered something in life, ran into God or observed God in action, and he left a word picture for others to consider. And that's exactly what we'll attempt this morning, as we ponder words written by one who was abiding in God. We learn as we walk with the psalmist. Consider verse 1 of Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Well, this is where we want to hang out today, with the psalmist dwelling in the shelter of God. Now, let me remind you that God is spirit, and hence, without a physical body. And the pictures the psalmist use are designed to awaken our souls and our minds to the spirit, to God's tangible reality, as our souls meet his spirit and benefit from his comfort. The psalmist uses words with physical weight and applies them to soul life and soul care. Consider four words that he uses in his first verse. Dwell as in remain or abide, to shelter in or to shelter under, maybe even to companion with. And then the word shelter, as in a roof or a covering, a protection overhead, maybe even in wound, nurtured. And then the idea of rest, as in catch your breath, to be restored, maybe to recuperate or to even heal. And then shadow. And this would make sense for one who lived in the desert, in the bright sun of the desert. This brings the idea of out of the bright light, out of the heat, a space that's less threatening. <clears throat> Lately, I've had a few moments when I wish I could say, enough, I'm done, get out of here, and I want this whole COVID mess to just go away. 
I feel less than enough to carry the weight that life demands that I lift. I feel more like the little boy wanting to play rather than the man the moments demand I be. I find myself slipping away by myself so that I can curl up safe against God. And sometimes that's simply enjoying longer times, reading more slowly, allowing the word to soak in to comfort me. And this is more me listening to than asking of him. I just need to feel safe or at least to feel protected as I wander in and out of less safe places. You see, when we choose to trust God and to be close to God, he covers us. And he wraps himself around us. And he protects us from anything that does not allow his best for us as he sees it. As we do daily life. That phrase, as he sees it, that being the key element. Sometimes he protects us from circumstances. And other times he strengthens us as we pass through those same circumstances. Knowing God and abiding God is not a magical incantation that uh, makes the hard stuff of life just go away. Usually, abiding in and dwelling with simply prepares us for more of so that we can continue living. I'd like to share four things from these verses in Psalm 91 about God. First, God is a secure place. We see that beginning in verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare, snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. There are three pictures in these verses. Three pictures that capture our invisible God. First, God is a fortress. God is a stronghold, a place that is not easily accessible by enemies. And when we're in that fortress, we feel safe. Secondly, God is our good eye as we do daily life, helping us avoid stumbling as we do life, helping us recognize and step over or around those trip hazards. And in those moments, we feel safe. And thirdly, God is our mother and guardian, eager to protect us with his wings to cover us to help us in those moments when we feel like we need to be preserved. It is his presence that does that. And when we recognize that, we feel safe. By faith, we realize that God is a secure place. The psalmist invites us to join him in dwelling in God, enjoying his wisdom before we jump back into the less safe place that life can be. And perhaps even today more so as we recognize how unsafe life is. Secondly, God is a strengthening place. We see this beginning in verse 5. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks us in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near you, your tent. Sometimes daily life or extreme circumstances reduces us to whimpering cowards. We jump at our own shadow. We fear the monsters under our bed. And we forget in the moment what we know. We forget the reality of our safe place as we cling by faith to our great God. We forget that. But faith chooses to rest in God's promises, not in what we might design or procure or what society around us might offer. Faith does not decide what human wisdom is best, but instead it turns us to our infinitely wise God. But faith, and hear me all the way through this, Faith does not always rescue us from the perils. Sometimes the arrow kills. Disease sometimes takes lives. Sometimes the bad guy wins. And, and sometimes, sometimes we ache under the weight of life. And the psalmist would have known that full well. 
He lived and he struggled for life in 10th century BC. It was a time of warfare and slaughter in a land that was stained by famine and plagues. But he knew, he knew God's strength and comfort in spite of heavy and hard circumstances because he knew God and he learned and actually rested in him. Now I recognize how badly we might want to or need to literally interpret these words in verses 5 through 10 for today. But sadly, we cannot do that. We cannot do that unless we do something uh, probably totally inappropriate with the scriptures. We would need to justify a literal meaning from the words written by a word artist, familiar with famine and pestilence, with war and destruction by so many enemies around him. It's simply not possible to do that. This is not a magical amulet. Instead, these words point us toward God. My friends, being in a safe place with God often transcends the danger of the physical world around us. Sometimes getting wet in the storm is safer than standing dry under a tree. Sometimes the safest place to stand is under the limits set by God or by God's anointed or appointed. And it might be that our current struggles are the exercise that God has allowed, maybe even appointed, to make us more like his son, Jesus. Thirdly, God is a safe place. We see that in verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And you will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Now we read in the New Testament uh, where Jesus was tempted by Satan. And in those temptations, Satan misapplied the words of this psalm as he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Satan had pressed Jesus to take advantage of words that were lifted out of context and twisted into a false promise. Now, I think it's safe for us to say that God has our backs, that he goes before us, that he, he's behind us and follows, and that he's beside us on both sides. And I think it is safe to believe that God protects, is protecting us. On the other hand, I think it is a lot less safe to believe that God protects stupidity or immorality. Bypassing common sense on the way home is a sure way to get oneself in trouble. Ignoring moral expectations often yields painful earthly consequences. Now, Jesus resisted the temptation, and he chose to cling to what he knew was the right thing. He chose the Father's will not Satan's dangled shortcut. And for us, as, we long, as long as we choose, as long as we choose what we understand to be the right way, as we obey the Lord, we will find it unnecessary to keep looking back. God is there. God is with us. He is a guardian for those choosing to love and to obey. Finally, God is a salvation place. We see this beginning in verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, once again, the psalmist sets some parameters wherein the intent of his words makes the best sense. It's when we love God. When we set him first, when we obey him most clearly, when we choose his ways, when we call him by name, when we turn to him first for direction. It is under the safety net of our redemptive position, our relationship with God, that we find the safest place to take on daily life. When we learn to accept what God allows in our lives, not whine and complain and rebel, we usually see he really is with us. We might even discover that in the harder moments, when we stop and remember God, as we choose to abide in him, that we will have greater strength to endure whatever life dishes up, even a pandemic engulfing a world. Psalm 91. The psalmist painted portraits of the safe place that God can be when we draw near, when we abide in him. 
when we know holds barred, trust this moment is absolutely not outside of his perfect will, we find perfect peace, the fruit of abiding, of dwelling. In Psalm 91, verse 1, we read, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Today and most days, for most of the past two months, these days have fallen into the testing our metal category. Well, I invite you to be as the psalmist, stopping as often as needed to lean into our safe and secure place, to lean into our amazing God and realize his real presence before you take on the next challenge. Please pray with me. Father, our safe place and unsafe times, we lean in towards you in search of strength and comfort. Allow us to know, not just hope, that you are with us, that you have this under control. We want to trust your purposes in what you allow in our lives. Grant us courage to take on each new day. Give us wisdom to know how to be safe. Use us to guide others stumbling around without you. Bless us this day and every day, we pray in the powerful name of Jesus.